You're listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, episode number 41. Welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast, a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of growing a healthy child. Here's your host, registered dietitian and childhood nutrition expert, Jill Castle. Hey there, I'm Jill Castle, host of the Nourish Child podcast, a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of raising healthy kids inside and out. As a pediatric dietitian, my goal is to help you raise nourished kids, and I do that through bringing topics and guests that inform, enlighten, and inspire you to use a holistic approach, including food and nutrients, feeding strategies, and child development. Today, we are talking about sports nutrition with Nancy Clark. Nancy is an internationally known sports nutritionist and best-selling author trusted by many top athletes. She's a registered dietitian and board-certified specialist in sports dietetics, and she teaches her clients how to have more energy, lose undesired body fat, enjoy a winning sports diet, and feel confident about their food choices. Nancy's how-to books on nutrition for sports and exercise, including her best-selling Nancy Clark's Sports Nutrition Guidebook and her food guides for new runners, marathoners, soccer players, and bicyclists, are popular resources. I regard Nancy as the queen of sports nutrition. She was one of the first registered dietitians to publish a book on the topic and bring sports nutrition to elite athletes and mainstream America. I think you'll be interested to hear her perspective on how things in the sports nutrition world have changed over the years. You'll find today's show notes with all the links I mention over at jillcastle.com forward slash number 41 or 041. That's jillcastle.com forward slash 041. Now, September I have deemed as Sports Nutrition Month, and if you listened to the last episode, which was episode number 40, you were able to listen to my interview with Dan Walsh, who is a former U.S. national team rower, as well as a a two-time Olympian and currently a youth rowing coach. So I interviewed him just on his perspective, first off, his story on how he got Um, to elite status and what it took from a nutrition standpoint to get him there. And then also his advice for young athletes everywhere who are embarking on their athletic performance. And you might be surprised in some of his advice. Uh, It's not too terribly fancy. uh, And he is definitely grounded in real food and really nourishing the body, mind and spirit with nutrition. Another piece of interesting news that has come out this month, and I wanted to share it with you, is the American Academy of Pediatrics clinical report called Promotion of Healthy Weight Control Practices in Young Athletes. Um, A hat tip or a thank you to Rebecca Scritchfield of the Body Kindness Podcast for mentioning this paper in a Facebook group that we belong to, and I wanted to dig into that and share that with you today. Um, Interestingly, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics has come out with um, some recommendations. Actually, they revamped their old paper from 2005 and have updated it with this 2017 uh, report. And they basically hone in on the different types of youth sports that can call for unhealthy weight control practices. For example, the wrestling sport, the sport of wrestling, where wrestlers might be trying to lose weight in an unhealthy fashion in order to meet their weight class, or football players who are trying to bulk up and gain more muscle mass. So they might be doing um, some uh, dangerous things with supplements and or, or extra protein that they might not need in order to do that. Dancers or runners who uh, their physique is encouraged to be slim and lean in appearance, and they might be uh, encouraged to be more restrictive in their eating, which is also unhealthy. So the paper is basically calling out um, unhealthy dieting, unhealthy supplement use, dehydration practices, uh, restrictive eating practices, and 
asking pediatricians and other healthcare professionals like myself to be very mindful of the messages that we send to young athletes and help them understand the role of nutrition and how to use it to their advantage, but not abuse it. So they really promote in this paper good health over focusing on a performance advantage from nutrition. And they point out also that, you know, weight control can be very detrimental to health, not only the physical health of athletes, but the mental and emotional health as well. So those athletes who might be inclined to use supplements or use practices where they are dehydrating themselves, loading up on layers and layers of clothing uh, in order to sweat out their body weight or lose weight that way, or some of the athletes who are really restrictive in their eating, barely eating enough to let alone support their metabolism, uh, but certainly not eating enough to help them perform as well as they could perform or even grow to their potential. So uh, I just want to share a quote from the American Academy of Pediatrics from the paper that says, unhealthy weight control approaches may adversely affect health and in some cases can negatively affect performance. And they also go so far as to recommend young athletes who are tempted or wanting or even needing to uh, change their weight status to seek out a registered dietitian nutritionist who has specialization in sports nutrition. So I really appreciated that, of course, because being somebody who uh, does a lot with youth sports nutrition, it's always nice to have other healthcare professionals recommend um, registered dietitians as a great resource for families who might need extra help and support in this area. So I wanted to share that with you. Personally, um, I'm getting ready to embark on a little whirlwind, a couple of weeks of travel and speaking. I'll be in South Dakota, actually at the end of uh, this week of this recording, speaking about sports nutrition for young athletes. And then I'm he heading over to Las Vegas to spend some time with my business people. And then on to Iowa and speaking about feeding and how it influences children's eating. And then, as you know from the last podcast, I'll be on the TEDx stage in Danbury on October 5th. So I am getting very, very focused on um, all these speaking and travel engagements and um, looking really forward to it. So if you're in any of those areas or at those meetings, please come up and say hello. I would love to meet you and chat, 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 chat. Remember, I have some youth sports nutrition resources for you. I will include them on the show notes as links. Eat Like a Champion, my book um, on performance nutrition for young athletes. Uh, as I mentioned in the last show, I have a sports nutrition course coming out for the young athlete to take. And of course, parents can take the course too, but it's really designed for the young athlete to take responsibility and, and, and be accountable for their own eating and their own sports nutrition diet. And then also I just had a recent blog post come out called Five Strategies to Start the Season Strong over on my blog at jillcastle.com forward slash blog. That might be helpful to you. I also have some helpful ebooks that I think will help you feed your athlete, including one on snacks, which includes a snack planner and some breakfast and dinner e-cookbook guides to help you out. All of that's over on my website, www.jillcastle.com. Uh, you can find them under the books tab, and you can look in my blog tab, and of course the podcast you'll find over there as well. So without further ado, let's get into the topic of the evolution of sports nutrition with Nancy Clark. Hi, Nancy. Welcome to the Nourish Child podcast. Hi, Jill. Thank you for inviting me to be here. Well, I'm, I'm delighted to have you on the show. I have been a huge fan of yours for a long time, and I, I think I told you several years ago, maybe at Fancy, that I had met you when I was in my internship at Mass General many, many moons ago. That was many moons ago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm sure you have a lot of people tell you that, a lot of dietitians. Um, yes. Well, it's, you know, when you've been in the field a long time, you get to meet a lot of people and 
um, it's just exciting that so many people that I met years ago are now going on to do really great things like you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Well, we are going to be talking about sports nutrition today. I'm actually doing somewhat of a theme for the month of September since so many athletes and their families are getting back into the swing of sports, uh, organized sports anyways. But I really wanted to focus this podcast on Uh, you and your experience with sports nutrition, how it has changed over the years and uh, what you see coming down the pipe potentially in the future. But before we get going on that, I want to take a moment to have you sort of introduce yourself to the audience and tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Well, my name is Nancy Clark and I'm in the Boston area. I have a private practice here where I work with casual exercisers as well as highly competitive athletes and really help them to reach their performance goals and um, win with good nutrition. So I I not only counsel clients one-on-one, but I meet a lot with um, you know teams at the college level or the high school level and, and work with the you know, the groups of the athletes. I give workshops to coaches and to dietitians and other health professionals. And it's just exciting how much people are embracing nutrition and sports nutrition these days because they're realizing that it really matters. Mm-hmm. Um, I've also written a, a best-selling book called Nancy Clark Sports Nutrition Guidebook, which is sold over, you know, 600,000 copies and is going strong because it's, it's meeting a need. People want to know, like, well, what do I do? You know, what do I eat these days? And, um, and I guess my, my pride and joys are not only my, my books and my career, but also so I have two children that are now uh, good citizens and mm-hmm. good eaters and my pride and joy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I hear you on that one. They yeah, they keep us grounded and keep us, you know, big part of my why anyways, uh, and I'm sure yours is, yeah. as well. Yeah. Now, speaking of your children, I'm, sh- I'm assuming um, they're up and out uh, of the house and sort of living their own lives and making their own decisions. And, um, you know, we always, I always tie back sort of that food experience as a child uh, with my guests. And I'm always curious, uh, and I ask this question all the time, when you look back on your own child, childhood, uh, you know, sort of what were the memories, what were the influences, and how did those or have they, how have they carried into your professional practice and even in your parenting practices? Well, when I was a kid growing up, it was in the era of Frosted Flakes and Rice Krispies and Jello and Hamburger Helper and all these new foods that were coming down the pipeline. And Food wasn't an issue. My grandmother would bring over tins, you know, three tins filled of cookies, would have sugar cookies, chocolate chip cookies, and hermits. And I mean, she, we just, cookies were around all the time. It wasn't a big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so food was just food. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it wasn't a political statement. Mm-hmm. It was enjoyed. We all ate out of the same pot. Um, it just wasn't a big deal. And you know, that's how I've raised my kids that, you know, there's variety of foods and enjoy it. And, and my, my daughter who is now 26, um, I think gave me a, a a wonderful compliment, um, a while ago and, and her, she shares an apartment with another woman and, and that other woman said, you know, you have the most you know, normal relationship with food that I've ever seen. (laughs) (laughs) And yeah, your your mother must have raised you right. (laughs) But yeah, food just, it's, it's part of life's pleasures. It's, we gather around food. We, um, you know, my, my daughter's really good at making these delicious cakes and we all enjoy them. And, um, and it's just, like I say, it's a non-issue. It's a, Mm -hmm. it's a, it's a source of pleasure and not a source of, fear or concern. Mm-hmm. Angst. Yeah. Angst. Yes. Yeah. And and today there are so many uh, individuals who are fearful and filled with angst when it comes to food. Do you see that in your athletes as well? 
Oh, I see it all the time with my athletes um, because weight, as you know, is a big issue among active people. And I work a lot with runners and ballet dancers and triathletes and rowers. And, you know, they all think, oh, if I'm just lighter, I'll be the better athlete. It's like, well, you know, if you were just better fuel, you'd be a better athlete. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but there, there's so much focus on weight. Um, and then they get afraid to eat or they think that carbohydrates are fattening and, um, you know, carbohydrates are actually fuel. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a lot of educating people, um, reminding them that food should indeed be one of life's pleasures, um, and, and not a source of angst. Mm -hmm. And just, um, in terms of just for the audience who's listening in, can you just give a, a real quick um, recap or explanation of the different nutrients and what their role is for the athlete? Because you said, you know, carbs are fuel. I think that's important for everybody to hear and understand. And sometimes uh, they don't have that understanding. So just real quick, carbs, protein, fat. Yeah, well, when I when I work with my clients, I um, the concept that I teach them about is is encourage them to see eating as a timeline, and we get a food bucket every four hours. In each bucket, you need some carbohydrate, some grain to fuel your muscle. You need some protein to build and repair muscles. You need some fruits and vegetables for vitamins and minerals. And you need some dairy or calcium rich food for um, bones, for, bo for bone health. Mm -hmm. And so I try to get away from carbs, proteins, and fats, but talk about food because that's what we really eat. Mm -hmm. We eat fruits and vegetables and grains. And, and people sort of go, oh, <laughs> food. Mm -hmm. and, and they're all caught up in the, their, their macros. Mm hmm. That's a great analogy and a great way to uh, make it very real and practical for parents to be able and, and athletes to be able to uh, break it down. Yeah. So you want at least, you know, four different kinds of at least three, if not preferably four different kinds of foods in each sports meal. So if somebody's just having, you know, grabbing a granola bar for breakfast it's like, whoa, just a minute, that's just a grain. Mm -hmm. Where's the, the protein, the fruit, vegetable, the dairy? So you can grab a granola bar and a yogurt and a banana, mm -hmm. you know, and a handful of nuts. And um, then they go, oh, you know, it's like, I could do that. Mm -hmm. And they feel so much better and probably are performing better as well as a result. Precisely, precisely. Yes. You know, yes. that's the goal, to, to be healthy and to perform better. Yes. So when we talk about young athletes, you know, they're getting younger and younger every day. I think I uh, read a stat uh, recently about uh, almost 47 million children are participating in organized sports and close to 8 million high schoolers are, are participating in uh, organized uh, high school based sports. So when we think about all these young athletes playing sports, when do you think that families should start thinking about or paying attention to nutrition? Well, I mean, when are talking about sports, we're really talking about energy. And, and so energy, you, you talk about from day one, um, because you want to eat, you want to listen to your body's cues for fuel. Mm -hmm. So I, um, you know, I, I, I just look at even fueling throughout the day. I look at the importance of honoring hunger and eating with hunger to keep energy up. And what would be an example that you're thinking of? Well, for example, you know, I, I see young, you know, soccer coaches or soccer coaches having young teams, you know, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds. Uh, should they be talking about sports nutrition to these young athletes? Or should parents just really take that mode of modeling, you know, the bucket of, of food every four hours or every, you know, three to four hours for the younger kids? Should they take that tactic and just really model what good nutrition is and fueling their child through what they model day to day? Or should, you know, when should 
uh, <clears throat> families or coaches be really sort of getting their athletes to pay attention to nutrition? Well, I, I think we always want to pay attention to health and energy. You know, I have parents that talk to me like, you know, do these little six-year-olds, do they really need to fuel up and refuel and, you know, recover afterwards? And it's like, hey, they're just out playing, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> and, and they should just be, you know, eating when they're hungry and stopping when they're content. And um, I, I would focus in on the importance of breakfast and, and, you know, putting gas in the car, but they will do that naturally, Mm -hmm. you know, at at an early age. It's when they get to the age of more, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh grade, where the girls are all saying, oh, no, food is fattening and I'm too fat. And then when that conversation comes in, when people are sort of dysregulated, that that's when I put more of a focus on like, hey, you know, it's not the thinnest athlete that's the best athlete. Let's make sure that you're well fueled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'd be, you know, looking at a slightly older age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, just even I find that I talk with younger families, just balancing the meal and making sure it's available you know, at those intervals of every three to four hours, more of us, I tend to talk about more of structuring your day and making yeah. sure that you're not forgetting about, you know, uh, breakfast, like you, like you mentioned, or don't uh, make sure you're not delaying dinner so late that your kids are so over hungry that, you know, they're, they're breaking down and upset and, you know, overeating and just uh, everything is off. Um, I think that, Sometimes our society makes sports nutrition for the younger crowd such a bigger deal than probably it needs to be. I don't know if you precisely okay. Yeah, I I, mean, I I totally agree with that. It is important for parents to take meal time seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, food is not optional. Sleep is not optional. We need to take food and sleep very seriously, and 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 have a structure to the day's, you know, fueling plan um, and not just have it be haphazard. And I think that's where people, you know, get lost in their busyness of, you know, oh, I'm too busy to cook. I'm too busy to eat, you know, to, to food shop, you know, oh, we're going to have dinner or I have no idea, you know, I haven't planned that ahead. And, and and for the moms or the dads, the parents, the caretakers to, let's say, to, to make a plan, to have a structure, to be responsible, to make sure that the right food is in the right place at the right time. Mm-hmm. I love that. Take it, take it seriously. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes but, we want the results of what it would be if we took it seriously. We want those results, but we're not there. Um, we're not engaged in what it means to take it seriously, which means have your own game plan, right, for your day of meals and sleep and all of those things. Yeah, but it, it's, you know, good nutrition for the kids starts with good nutrition for the parents. Mm-hmm. And there there are too many people these days that are wrapped up in good food and bad food. Mm-hmm. You know, there's not good or bad food. There's a balanced diet and an unbalanced diet. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, and, and there's so much belief that food is fattening. It's like, no, no food is fuel. And, and, and so when you get, you know, dieting parents that are trying to stay away from food and they get too hungry and, you know, things go crazy, it, it's just bad role modeling. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so there's so much nutrition for the parents that needs to be done for the kids to get the right messages Mm -hmm. that um, they can eat when they're hungry, stop when they're content, you know, balance in fun foods with, you know, more nutrient rich foods and it all comes out in the wash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. I say I go back, I go back to my grandmother brought over, you know, three tins of cookies and it's like, we enjoyed them. Mm -hmm. And, we're all alive, thriving, in a piece of food. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think sometimes we've gotten too, uh, oh, too charged over desserts. Yeah. <laughs> we get too charged up about yeah, those things. And, and, 
Yeah, and, and, and so I spend a large part of my counseling hours putting things into perspective. Like there's, there's this huge anti-sugar campaign. And it's like, well, let's just look at who's, the, who, who, who's against sugar. I mean, if you're you know, an overfat, underfit, you know, couch potato sitting there drinking a big Slurpee, you know, that's one conversation. If you're, you know, an active teenage athlete who needs calories – um, and is is burning, you know, off fuel. It, is having a dessert a sin? You know, a nutritional sin. Mm-hmm. And 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 so there, you know, messages for people that are unfit versus those that are fit. And with sugar, you know, ten percent of calories can come from sugar for mm-hmm. an active person. That's you know. 200 calories of sugar a day. Do we really need to get all upset about that? Right. So again, it's just giving people um, perspective. That's what we're missing. We're missing perspective. We get so much all or nothing. And there's this thing called balance and moderation that isn't, <laughs> isn't being heard. Right. And isn't very sexy, to be honest, but it works. It is not. <laughs> yeah, it works. It works. I know. <laughs> so I consider you to be one of the original sports dietitians, and I'm curious as to, you know, what you have seen over the years evolve. I think what I've seen evolve is this whole plethora of commercial sports foods. So first there was Gatorade, and then there were Par Bars, and then there's oodles of other products came along the pike. And now there are just so many, you know, sports nutrition products, be they bars, protein powders, beverages, recovery drinks, you know, meal replacements, you know, weight gainers. I mean, there's just so much out there. Mm -hmm. And people forget that food works. Mm -hmm. And, And so there's so much focus put on these you know, sports food products that I spend a lot of time getting people go, let's go back to the basics. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's a time and a place for these products. I mean, certainly, you know, sports drinks were designed to be taken during endurance exercise. So if you're out there running a marathon, you know, you're out there for more than, you know, an hour and a half, you want to take in some source of, um, you know, sports drink or water plus carbohydrates in whatever form you might prefer, um, you know, during the exercise, you know, do kids that are doing an hour of soccer practice need a sports drink during practice? You know, so it, it just gets, it raises a lot of confusion as to when are these products best used? Cause they're all marketed to the masses mm-hmm. and cause there's a lot more, you know, a lot more ordinary people than there are elite athletes that, might really benefit from the products. Mm -hmm. And do you think any of these, you know, is there abuse of these products? Are they in and of themselves dangerous in isolation? Or is it more of the user danger that that can come into play? Or is there no danger whatsoever? Well, some of the, you know, I'd I'd be really wary of some of the the protein powders and, and weight gainer products. Um, who knows what's in it? So if you're buying any protein stuff, you always want to look for NSF on the label, which means that it has a little bit of um, integrity to the product and, and you might be getting what you're buying. But with any of these supplements, um, you know, what what's on the label might be not what's inside, what, what you're actually consuming. Mm-hmm. Um but if you're sticking to, you know, sports drinks and energy bars and, and um, you know, gels and goos, I'm not particularly concerned about that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. But when you get into the, the um, you know, the protein powders and protein shakes, again, they're highly engineered. I mean, that's not we're, – we're not designed to eat just protein. We're, we're designed to eat foods – that are that are protein rich, you know, along with a lot of other nutrients. So it's, it's fascinating how I have so many people that are very healthy eaters, and and they wouldn't touch, you know, a refined product uh, like, you know, uh, I know a, a, a commercial um, engineered food, but they think nothing about 
taking a protein powder. It's like, yeah, that's pretty highly processed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, as you look over, you know, as you look over the decades and, and you look at what what has been how, – how the field of sports nutrition has evolved, what do you see as um, the future of sports nutrition? I see the future of sports nutrition as being a wonderful way to get people back to eating quality foods, uh, less process, closer to the earth, lots of fruits and vegetables and whole grains – lean proteins and, and eating on a schedule, like say not skipping meals, but eat, looking at even energy throughout the day, even protein throughout the day. Um, so I, I see it as a bridge to getting America back to eating how it used to. Mm-hmm. I mean, it used to have, you know, breakfast and lunch and, you know, a second lunch, dinner and, um, and it was eating for a purpose. It used to be eating for energy to be able to do all the farm work. And now it's eating for energy to, you know, play a, a fun game of soccer after school. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd like to see, you know, food is fuel become, get us more back to the basics and also to see sports as becoming more fun in play. It, it's getting pretty intense these days. Mm-hmm. And even though I'm a sports nutritionist who's very supportive of sports, um, I, I, I get distressed. Like I say, when you have six-year-old kids that are being trained like they're mm-hmm. high school kids. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. I do too. What um, mistakes do you think uh, some of these young athletes, some of the bigger mistakes that they're making, or just even just trends in the youth sports world that you are wary of, aside from the overtraining? Mistakes would be that, you know, these commercial products are better than real foods, mm. the natural foods, that protein from a bar is more powerful than scrambled eggs. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> Mistakes would be good food, bad food. You have to have a perfect diet to be a perfect athlete. You know, like here in New England, Tom Brady is really into really into nutrition mm-hmm. and has deemed, you know, frosted flakes and sugar is evil. And it's like, you know, there's some merit to shaking people up and getting them to look at what they're eating. But again, it comes back to the good food, bad food. And I'd like to get back to balanced diet and unbalanced diet Mm -hmm. and know that birthday cake fits into a balanced diet. Yeah. It's always concerning when a large celebrity, and I am a fan of Tom Brady, I feel like a little bit like I watched him grow up because Uh (laughs) I lived in Boston (laughs) when he, you know, he was pulled up as second string for, uh, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, Drew. Through somebody, yeah. but anyways, um, it's 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 uh, concerning because you know when we talk about young athletes, they very much look up to these professional athletes. They very mm-hmm. much mm-hmm. believe everything they say. And one of the things that I think that parents need to remember is that you know professional athletes are grown human beings. They have already you know, grown to their full potential, Mm -hmm. whereas children have not. And Mm -hmm. there is this, you know, separate energy need that is completely tied to growth that has nothing to do with sport. And uh, it's always, to me, very concerning when I'll see when I see a public figure state that, you know, sugar is bad, or carbs are bad, and it's only vegetables, and it's only uh, this, these three protein sources that I'm eating or whatever their, you know, Mm -hmm. diet that they have figured out for themselves that they think is great for themselves. Forget whether Mm -hmm. it's a sustainable over time diet. Um, but they put that out to the public and then these young athletes and their parents are glomming on to that as if, as if it is, you know, the Bible. And, um, Mm -hmm. that's always concerning to me because it, it A is imbalanced as you were speaking of before, but B it's also um, 
a setup for such a poor relationship with food and a struggle that's going to continue to grow and grow over time potentially. Yeah, I'm a bad person. I eat a cookie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I sinned. It's like, no, you know, if you had, you know, your sandwich and glass of milk and an apple and then a cookie, it all balances in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. So when you think about young families who are starting out with their children in the world of sports, what advice would you give them in terms of nutrition? I'd say read Ellen Satter's book, Secrets of Feeding a Healthy Family. I think that should be required reading by every single parent. (laughs) Um, Good advice. Yeah, the name is Ellen Satter, Secrets of Feeding a Healthy Family, because it is so confusing. Who do you believe? There's so much information and so much misinformation. And, um, you know, Ellen is really the expert on family feeding. And if you set a good foundation with her, then everything else will fall into place later on as the kids get older and and, um, tromp off to the local store and come back with, you know, bags of, you know, Skittles. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, how do you handle that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So that would be my advice. Mm -hmm. Good advice. And And to keep... Go ahead. I'm sorry. And to keep and, and to keep sports fun, I mean, mm-hmm. the the purpose of it is to move the body and have you know have friends and to play and um, you know do a variety of different sports, not just to focus in on one, because you know people are getting too uh, specialized at too early an age. Mm-hmm. Agree. Agree. And I will include the link to Ellen's book in the show notes so people will be able to get it right off of Amazon if they want to. So, Nancy, what are you working on now? Right now, I'm actually um, trying to get a little bit more information on millennials that were athletes in high school and college and if they're having trouble having babies, having starting mm-hmm. a family and troubles with infertility. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's a whole group of women that grew up with food is fattening. If I'm thinner, I'll be a better athlete. They may have, you know, lost their periods um, due to lack of appropriate f- fuel. And then, you know, here they are, you know, 25, 30, 35, or even older thinking, oh, maybe it's time to start a family. And it's like, whoa, this isn't happening as easily as I thought it would. Mm. So that's I'm, very I'm, interesting. Uh, yeah, it, 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 and it is. And um, so just trying to get some, gather up some data. So how prevalent is this? And what messages do we need to be giving to these you know, young ladies at an early age that, you know, missing your period isn't a good thing. It's a sign that you're not taking proper care of your body Mm -hmm. and um, you need to give it a little bit more fuel. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So Nancy, where can um, listeners find you if they want to locate your blog or your website or your books? My website is nancyclarkrd.com. So that's N-A-N-C-Y. C L A R K R D as in registered dietitian dot com, and there has information about my sports nutrition guidebook. I have food guides for soccer players and for new runners and marathoners and cyclists. I have teaching materials for people that are giving sports nutrition talks or want some handouts, and also an online workshop for people that are just interested in sports nutrition or, or actually want continuing it professionals that want continuing education credits. And there's a place called on my, on my website, there's a a link to my blog and there's also something called contact Nancy. And if you hit the contact Nancy button and send me an email, I'll just mention that I heard you on your podcast. They, that they heard me on your podcast and I'll be glad to answer their question. Wonderful. That's great. I think you'll get lots of little contact Nancy requests. (laughs) (laughs) Nancy, thank you so much for taking your time today to be on the Nourish Child podcast. Uh, You have just such great, wise, uh, knowledgeable insight for parents of young athletes and, and just the field of sports nutrition. I know a lot of people will be interested in hearing 
your perspective on that. So thank you. Well, it's been my pleasure, Jill, and thanks for all that you're doing to educate, you know, these parents and their young kids about the importance of fueling well throughout the whole entire lifetime. Well, there you have it, folks. I hope you enjoyed today's show today with Nancy Clark, sports dietitian, author of Nancy Clark's Sports Nutrition Guidebook. Um, I think she had a lot of great insight, particularly around the importance of sports nutrition for young athletes, when the young athletes should start paying attention to nutrition, and how serious they should actually be about it. Is it that prescriptive for the young athlete, or is it more about setting a rhythm and balance to all those meals and snacks? She also gave us insight over Um, what she has seen over the years evolve in terms of sports nutrition, which I thought was really uh, interesting. And then her own philosophy about how food and nutrition fits into any athlete's life. Again, all of the show notes will be over on my website, jillcastle.com forward slash 041. That's 041 for episode number 41. I will also include the link to Nancy's website, her books, uh, and she has several. And um, I'll also include a link to the paper from the American Academy of Pediatrics. I sure hope you enjoyed the show today. If you can help the Nourish Child podcast grow, please write a review on iTunes, subscribe to the show, share the podcast on social media, wherever you hang out. It always helps the show grow a little bit more and more importantly, shares the information with parents who could really benefit from hearing it and, in turn, benefit their children with this great, valuable information. As always, thank you for joining me today. I'm so, so glad that you were here. Please be sure to give that child in your life, big or small, a loving squeeze today. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, where the number one goal is to help you grow a nourished child inside and out.